Yay! End of the day! Yay! Has everybody had a good couple of days? Is your head about ready to explode? So I don't often get to be the last speaker. In fact, I don't think I've ever been the last speaker. So I've been told that part of my job is to make sure your head does explode. So I apologize if that happens in advance. And I'm just chosen to interpret the blank stares as head explosion instead of boredom. So I'm here to talk about building the machine that designs the designs. The last couple of days, you've heard a lot about how to actually do the work. I want to kind of pop up one level and talk about how to create the environment and how to create the machine that produces the work. You know, a lot of people think about Steve Jobs as having created a bunch of amazing products. I think about him as having created a couple of amazing companies, companies that reliably create amazing creative work. And so uh, I'd like to share with you a few things that I've learned at Apple, Yahoo, and Pinterest about how to build a machine that helps build, design the designs. So I've been in design manager for about 10 different years now, about 10 years now, and I've learned about five different things. Actually, I've learned probably 500 things, but there's five of them I want to share with you today. The first one is that management is a way to scale your impact as a designer. You know, in 2005, I had the opportunity to uh, interview for a director of design job at Yahoo to help lead the design team that was working on Yahoo Search. And I was a little anxious about moving out of the chair, as they say, getting out of the chair and getting a seat at the table. You know, I felt like I was going to lose the craft. I was going to lose my impact as a designer. And being a manager was sort of uh, a decision I was trying to think through really carefully. And I had a chance to reach out to a friend of mine, a guy named Hugh Duberly, and he told me an amazing story that I want to share with you today, because I know that many designers face the same question and wonder what they want to do if they want to go on the management track or stay on the individual contributor track. He told me a story about these two gentlemen. This is Bill Paley, this amazing portrait by Richard Avendon. He was president of CBS. And on the far side, William Golden, who was basically creative director, head of creative services at CBS. He's the man that came up with the CBS logo, which is one of the great marks in American graphic design history. So it turned out that at one point, Jack Benny decided to retire from CBS, and of course, he'd been one of their major stars. And uh, so Bill Paley called up Golden, because of course, they worked together and they knew each other really well. And he said, hey, so Jack Benny's going to leave the network, and I think we should throw him a big retirement party. I'm thinking we'll do something to wall up for story. It'll be a really you know, nice affair. Could you work on an invitation over the weekend? William Golden says, yep, I'll take care of that this weekend. He's driving to the Hamptons, because I guess that's what you do when you're in New York. Driving to the Hamptons, thinking it through, and he realizes, you know, Jack Benny's sort of famously cheap. Like, he's really well known as a cheapskate. Like, a Waller for Story is probably not the place that Jack Benny wants to have a retirement party. And so he has this amazing idea over the weekend. He comes back on Monday, and he pitches it to Bill Paley. And the idea is, instead of the Waller for Story, we're going to have Jack's retirement party at an automat in Manhattan. So an automat, for those of you that don't know, is sort of like a convenience store that only has vending machines in it. And it's something you do if you don't want to spend a lot of money, right? So it was perfect. It perfectly captured Jack Benny. They called up Jack. They pitched the idea. Jack Benny loved the idea. They had an amazing party. Jack Benny stood at the door, handed out rolls and nickels to people as they came in, got out of their limos, <laughs> fancy dresses, played the violin a little bit. It's an amazing event. Uh, got covered on the newspapers all around the country. I've seen photos of it. It's a phenomenal story, phenomenal party. And Hugh told me at the end, he goes, the reason I tell you this is because there's not a chance that William Golden would have ever had the opportunity to pitch that idea if he had been deeper down in the organization. The only way he could have that sort of leverage and that sort of impact is to be right next to the seat of power. He said, you should move into management because it's how you get to the table. You know? It's how you're going to scale your impact and your influence. And so I did. I took the job at Yahoo, and it wasn't too long before I got there that I had to confront this question of like, if I'm going to be a manager, like, what does that mean? What kind of manager do I want to be? Do I want to be a player coach? Do I want to be a coach? Do I want to be a dictator? There's lots of different models for management. I wasn't really quite sure because I hadn't worked in a lot of big companies where I had a manager to look up to. And I came across this book, which was referenced earlier today, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. I'm going to make a bigger pitch for it. You should definitely get this book, and you should definitely get it in hardback. It's an amazing physical artifact, uh, and it's just a terrific book written by Gordon McKenzie. It must have come out around 2003, 2004. Gordon was a designer at Hallmark Cards, and so he was trying to invent cards, but he had to deal with this gigantic corporate hierarchy in Kansas City to deal with that. And so the book kind of talks about navigating as a creative, navigating this bureaucracy. And in part of the book, and this, the whole book's not like this. In part of the book, he goes to this yellow sheet thing, which is why you want to get the book in physical copy and not electronic. And he compares this model of the pyramid and the plum tree. And this became how I think about management, right? So he starts out here, and we'll cop, cop, uh, cap, uh, jump over there to the pyramid. Conversations within the pyramid organization, right? The executives are at the top. We can see forever. It's awesome, right? Middle management, get out of my way. I'm pushing, I'm shoving, I'm trying to get up to the top. And down at the bottom, the product producers, you know, the people who are actually coming up with what the company's valued for, they're like, geez, I wonder what it's like up there at the top. What's the weather? And then things get a little stressful. 
The folks up at the top is like, we must grow or we're going to die. And middle management, you know, they're pushing and shoving. They're looking down at the bottom like, you guys have to work harder. The beatings will continue until morale improves, you know. And the people down at the bottom are like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, could somebody just get me out from underneath this crushing weight? And so McKinsey talks about the plum tree as a different model. The plum tree, the people who are producing the work, they're really at the top of the, the organization. They're the ones closest to the sky. They're the ones closest to the air, right? And they're producing the plums, which is actually the crop, the thing that the company sells. And the role of middle management is to be the branches, to get the nutrients out to those individuals. And of course, the trunk is the executive management, right? It's providing the stability and bringing all the nutrients from the soil up. And the conversation there is very different. You know, the people at the top are like, man, on a clear day, we can see forever. And the middle manager's like, what do you need to, to help you? What, do you like, how, what can we do? And they're like, hey, man, we're great. We've got sunshine. We've got water. All is good. You know, and he closes this section over on the far side there with a semantic comparison between the pyramid and the plum tree. You know, I don't think I really thought about the pyramid being a tomb. I thought about these giant structures in Egypt. And, of course, they are tombs. But I don't know if I really thought of them as tombs, right? But they are. Hierarchy for creative people is really kind of like a tomb. It sucks and probably some of you know that. The comparison to the plum tree is interesting because the tree is ever-changing, it's ever-growing, right? It's very dynamic. Most of the companies you work at are probably like this, and you never know kind of from day to day where the branches are going to go and where the leaves are going to show up, and at times it probably seems really disorienting, but if you buy into the idea of being a tree, it's a wonderful ride, right? So I began to realize as a manager, I wanted to be those branches that got the nutrients out to the edges. I didn't want to be at the top of that pyramid. And the philosophy, sort of the framework as a designer that I came to is this idea that if you get the right people, and you surround them with the right product process, you'll get terrific product as a consequence, right? So instead of focusing just on the product and thinking I had to make my stamp as a designer, I was going to come up with the solutions. I realized that my focus should really be on getting the right people, enveloping in the right process, and letting them do the magic that they're designed to do, that they're intended to do, that we just saw from the two women who presented from Asana. So I realized that my job as a design manager, that I was going to have the opportunity to use my design talents, you know, how I approach the world as a designer. I was going to have that to really design the machine that designs the designs. And I still go to work every day as a manager thinking like a designer. You know, I think about doing research. I think about trying different things. I think about trying to create a future that I want to live in and then developing all the mechanisms and frameworks and communication to get us there. So done thoughtfully, I strongly believe design management will significantly broaden your influence, your impact, and your reach. That's sort of lesson number one. Management's a great way to scale. Lesson number two, every product development process should feature a predictable path to yes. You know, and people kind of get upset when we talk about the path to yes because in a way it's talking about process. But you know, process exists in every decision you make with somebody else. I had a good chance to be at, uh, at dinner with Ben last night and he was talking about his family. He's got four kids and I was sort of wondering like, how do you guys figure out dinner, right? Like that's just a lot to deal with. And there's a process. As a family, they have a process to figure out dinner. You know, all of you have a process with your team to figure out what you're going to build and how you're going to ship it, right? Process defines sort of the rules, the norms, and the methods by which you're going to make those collective decisions. And I believe the key purpose to process is to figure out the path to yes. How are we going to decide when something's good enough to go out? And I think there's four different models that people generally use for the path to yes that I want to go through in a little bit more detail. First one is date-driven. You know, at some point, maybe you agree to a date. This obviously is... Uh, Buzz Aldrin on the moon, summer of 1969. This was a date that many people were working towards for about seven or eight years. 400,000 people were involved in getting Buzz Aldrin onto the moon, along with Neil Armstrong, thousands and thousands of companies. They committed to a date, and nobody wanted to be the person that blew that date. So lots of decisions were made to hit those dates, and the people involved in those decisions recognized the compromises, and they went at home at night thinking that there was a fairness to the system because they understood the importance of hitting the date. For those of you who are family photographers, I'd love to point out one thing in this photo. Neil Armstrong, of course, was the first man to walk on the moon, but uh, there's only one photograph of Neil that was actually shot on the surface of the moon, and it's this one, although this is a picture of Buzz, but if you look in Buzz's visor, you'll see a reflection of Neil, because all of you like family photographers who don't show up in your family photos. It turns out Neil had the camera, and so there's only pictures of Buzz on the surface except this one reflection. And sometimes you're going to make decisions by metrics. Like this is sort of the famous, you know, 27 shades of blue. We're going to decide. We're going to live by whatever the numbers tell us. You know, we heard from Keenan the other day the difference between metrics driven and metrics influenced. I like metrics influenced a lot more. It speaks to me more as a designer. But there are times you're going to make decisions from a metrics driven uh, perspective. And I kind of compare this a little bit to Darwinian evolution. We're going to decide what the survival of the finish, fittest means. And typically that means click-through rate. Sometimes it means new accounts. Darwinian evolution, it means reproduction. So how are we going to decide? And we're just going to try permutations, and we're going to see where it leads. You know, and if you give evolution a really long period of time, it gets you cool stuff. It gets you tigers and panda bears and moray eels. It takes a few billion years, 
and it doesn't really ship on time, but it gets you to some really cool places, right? Problem is you might get a six-headed shrimp along the way. And so if you're going to make decisions and you're going to live and die by metrics, you have to ask yourself if you're willing to live with a six-headed shrimp. And then there's consensus-driven, which is probably what many of you use, right? Uh, and I've talked to a bunch of different startups and a few of my friends over at Twitter. At Twitter, they have these meetings they call EPD meetings, right? So this is engineering, product, and design. And lots of companies talk about trying to balance this triad. And I heard this triad over and over again. And I haven't turned, heard too many companies that really had it working well, but they all aspired to it because they all somehow believed that was where they needed to get. And it made me kind of think about the structure of the federal government. You know, this is James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution. Of course, the federal government's uh, structured around this idea of balance of powers, you know, three separate but equal branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And I think it's kind of an interesting model for balancing engineering, product, and design. Like, if you think about the president, sort of like a product manager, right? They, they have some power, they don't have all the power, they tend to set the timelines, they kind of send, tend to set the agenda, they're out talking a lot, sort of advocating, constantly pushing, right? And you look at the legislature or the engineering, like engineering is a little bit like the legislature, there tends to be a lot of them, they're a little contentious, kind of fight amongst themselves, they own a lot of resources, <laughs> you know, they have a lot of influence and they do come up with ideas of their own that they try to push through the other branches and if you want to do anything, you got to get them on board. And then you have the judiciary, which for our purposes I'll describe as the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's a little bit like design, right? It's about nine people, should be nine people. Um, you know, they tend to debate a lot of stuff behind closed doors. The rest of the team doesn't really quite know what's going on. Over a period of time, they tend to come out with recommendations that have been deliberated. They tend to be logical arguments that really emphasize consistency and precedent. And people tend to go along with them, even though they're kind of, at the end of the day, opinions. People tend to go along with them because they feel it's the right thing to do, right? The Supreme Court, like design, has no enforcement capabilities. We don't have an army. We don't have a budget. People go along because they know it's the right thing to do, right? And if you think about that structure, when it's working well, as it has for generally for the last few hundred years, it's incredibly well balanced, and it's stable, and it's reliable, and people understand that's how we make decisions. The trick is everybody in each one of those groups has to appreciate and understand the incentives of the people in the other groups, and they have to be sure to never take it personally, right? And I think when you see the EPD model and companies working really well, it's because they've arrived at that sort of uh, understanding of each other and what they're all trying to do. So consensus driven. And then finally, the fourth one that a lot of people are familiar with is authority driven. It's probably the easiest one to understand. Somebody's going to make all the calls. This guy probably doesn't necessarily look like an authority figure, but he is. This is John Lasseter, founder of Pixar, director of the Toy Story movies. Uh, by all accounts, a happy-go-lucky guy, but at the end of the day, he's making the decisions. And it turns out the movie industry figured out the authority-driven path to yes a long time ago. They have this model called a director, and the director's responsible for the movie creatively from soup to nuts. Very few technology companies have pulled that off, you know, and very few projects really demand that. And I think it's because movies are a fixed deliverable in time, whereas technology software products keep going and going. You don't really want one person having to make all the decisions for the life cycle. But if you're doing something brand new, it's not crazy that you would need a single authority figure to help guide it through all the different debates and all the different trade-offs to, to bring an entirely new product to, to market. I don't know if authority-driven scales, I don't know if it's sustainable, but it's definitely a model and it's a really clear way to get to a path to yes. And so I bring all of them up, I think there's probably a bunch of other ones. Like all these models, they have uh, pros and cons, they're applicable to different solutions, to different problems at different times. I think the trick for you as a manager is to make sure that you're clear and consistent in your own head and with your team about how you're going to make decisions together. What is your path to yes going to be? And I talk about how path to yes should be more like mountaineering than spelunking. So spelunking, cave diving. Like this is a really cool looking picture. These guys are in a cave, looks awesome, you know. The funny thing is like they don't really know what's behind that corner. So they may think that they've gotten the four VPs approval they need, but just behind the corner they might hit the legal department and suddenly they're in for another six months of approval process. You heard the story earlier about the woman who came up with the Citibank logo and how many approvals she had to go through. There was no clear path to yes for her. And so when we see pictures of caves, we see them like this because they're lit. But if you're actually in the cave, if you're actually the person trying to figure out the cave, it looks like this. Because they only like the cave long enough to take the picture. <laughs> you know? So if you have a path to yes that's not clearly defined, it feels like total darkness to the people stuck in the middle of it. I talk about how it should feel a little bit like mountaineering, which this looks scary, but it's clear, right? You're trying to get to the top. You can actually chart a course there. I'm not saying people don't struggle on these things. I'm not saying the path, to e the path to yes should be simple or easy, but it should be clear, right? And it should be reliable. So lesson number two, path to yes. Number three, a great manager helps their people grow. Last few years have taught me that uh, uh, clear expectations, 
are just the number one predictor of employee uh, satisfaction and employee engagement, both for myself and my own work, but also for my team. Like, how clear can you be about what, about what people are supposed to do, what the expectations are for their behavior, what their scope of responsibility is? It's also a little surprised to learn that, op that designers rate opportunity to learn as the most important thing to them in their job. And we've heard that a little bit over the last couple of days. I think I intuitively knew that designers, like myself, are intensely curious people. But I don't know if as a design manager I came to work every day thinking it was a big part of my job to provide opportunities to learn from my team. I actually did this little poll on uh, Twitter a while back for another presentation I was working on. I got 545 votes, which my high school children laughed at, but I thought it was a decent number. Um, <laughs> You know, Twitter only let me put these four options up there. I'd gotten these options from a couple of individual contributor designers I worked with. Um, and you can see right off the bat, 33% opportunity to learn. After that, personal impact. And then pretty far back, you pick up company mission and compensation. You know, as a manager, it was always easy for me to talk about compensation or company mission because they were, I could pitch the company mission and I could affect compensation. Again, I don't know if I came to work every day as a manager thinking that a big part of my job and my team's happiness and their creativity was going to depend on me maximizing their personal impact giving them an opportunity to learn. And so one of my takeaways from that was the importance of having career ladders in your company. And I haven't worked in too many companies that had really clear career ladders. I'm starting to see it more and more, but lots of companies don't have it, especially small startups. And so I took a little time and was able to back up and kind of look at what a career path would look like. And I think this is one of the things Ben, really Ben Peck had reached out to me to talk about. And so these titles actually come from an AIGA salary survey. You see down here from 2014, so it's a little dated. It's uh, 8,700 uh, uh, votes, so a little bit better than my 500. And you can see that the years experienced junior designers less than two years. And then you go up to principal designer, which you also might call a creative director uh, at 10 years plus. You know, I put the salaries up there because I think a lot of times we lose track of how lucrative our field actually is. $40,000 is a pretty good salary for somebody just out of school. And I like to point out design doesn't require a college degree. It's great if you have a college degree, but a lot of design jobs can be done without a college degree. Right out of school, making 40 grand. This is a nationwide median income. That's a pretty good number. That second number, a couple of years in, you get that promotion, you're making 53 grand. I don't know what that means in Salt Lake City. These numbers vary a lot. These numbers are almost double this when you get into San Francisco and New York. Still, $53,000 is within just a couple of grand of the household, in, the, sorry, the median household income for a family of four in the United States. So that's a pretty good job. And you go all the way up to principal designer, you're breaking into six figures. Again, in San Francisco, New York, that's twice that high. It's $200,000. Like, these are, these are good jobs. So I want to talk a little bit about each one of these, what each one of these mean. Junior designer, what does that really mean? You know, we use these labels often to talk about how long people have been in the industry, but they're actually really different jobs, right? So a junior designer's primary job is to work in the service of other people's ideas. They help other designers scale by sort of being their hands. They tend to execute a lot of the permutations that need to be explored in order to make an intelligent design decision. And again, I sort of break this down into how these people, how these different roles perform against this measure of people, process, and product. So in the case of people, they're an organ integral part of the team. They're focused on their individual output. They're assigned specific tasks, and they receive pres prescriptive feedback, make this blue, change that font size, change this animation. They're told kind of what to do, and their job really is to go execute it. When you move up to the next level of staff designer, you're working in the service of your own ideas. And that's probably where the bulk of designers live. Anytime you hear somebody say, oh, they're the only designer on that project, they're working as a staff designer because they don't have any help. Right? So they're working on their own stuff. They're driving cross-functional interactions. They're reaching out to PM, engineering, research, the executives. They're focused on their individual output, but they're also starting to interact with junior designers and interns and trying to mentor and grow the next generation of talent. They're given specific deliverables and feedback, and occasionally it presented at the executive level, so they're starting to develop those storytelling skills that Keenan talked about. They're still executing high-quality solutions, and they're in an established problem space, but they're kind of finding their own way to do it. They're finding a unique way to do checkout, a unique way to do search features, things like that. Next level up, you get senior designer. This is, this is the crew that's really developing the work and creating the ideas that are going to be executed in part by the junior designers. At this point, the company's investing in you and, and helping you scale. You know, you're proactively engaging with other disciplines. You're a key collaborator for other designers. You know, senior designers are sought out by other people on the team for their creative input. You're presenting your own work at all different levels of the company, and you're synthesizing feedback. Right? You're probably getting differing feedback from different people, and you're trying to listen through that and figure out your own interpretation of what that means. And finally, you're creating and perfecting different solutions and established problem spaces. Like you're coming up a new way to do something that other companies have explored. 
Next, lead designer, you're driving and coordinating ideas for a specific product area. In the case of Facebook, you might be the lead designer for newsfeed or search or growth or account management, right? And you're probably coordinating multiple senior designers, multiple junior designers, not necessarily managing them, but helping to coordinate them. You're presenting your own work at all levels of the company, internal and external. You're talking at conferences like this. You're talking to the press. Um, you know how and when to engage feedback from others. You're starting to figure out how to play the company, you know, how to understand how to use the company to get ideas out into the public. And you're imagining and executing original solutions in a problem space that's unique to that company. So again, somebody at, at Facebook might be focused on newsfeed. Newsfeed's critical to Facebook's success, so you'd have a lead designer working on that part. And the top of the, the, of the career ladder here, principal designer. Principal designer is setting the tone and driving the framework for system-wide ideas, right? They're sort of saying this is how the product works as an entire system. And they're using that and they're communicating it down to the other designers. So they're pr kind of providing the framework where all those other ideas take place. They're a key leader across the company and they're a major factor in recruiting. People come to your company to work with your principal designers. They're also championing process improvements and they're able to listen through feedback for deeper meaning. Even when they're hearing controversial and different ideas from all different executives, they're the ones that have to figure the path through all that different feedback. And then they're imagining and coming up with completely original ideas for the company. They're ahead of the executives, they're ahead of the industry, they're ahead of the competition. You know, and I think the great thing about that progression is sort of as Baden-Powell did when he developed Boy Scouts, is it gives you this great progression of ranks, if you will. And it, it shows to designers how, with the kind of skills they need to get to move to the next level. It helps you as a manager figure out how to develop those talents by giving them particular problems, particular opportunities to get those experiences to move up that ladder. There's a great quote from Peter Drucker, developing talent is business's most important task, the sin qua non of competition in a knowledge economy. Like a big part of your job as a manager is developing the talent. And something like these career ladders, and these are some that I've come up with, I would hope you'd come up with your own for your company and the unique needs of your company. You know, that provides a really nice milestones and steps for the employees as they move up the ladder. That's number four, the candidate experience. It's one of your most important design projects. I've had a chance to interview at a couple of companies recently, and I hadn't been on that side of the table for a long time. It's a little bit like a doctor having to go in for surgery. Being a patient's a really eye-opening experience, I can tell you. And one of the things that I've learned is that from a candidate's perspective, the candidate experience is the, probably the best predictor of what it's gonna be like to work at that company. It needs to be designed and thoughtfully executed. And I could tell that not many of the companies I talked to had actually designed what their whole hiring experience was going to be like. You know, it sort of seemed to vary quite a bit. You'd see uh, differences from one company to another. You'd see differences of what the recruiter told you was going to happen, what actually did happen. They didn't seem to have a playbook that they were consistently following. So as a candidate, I came to value sort of transparency, consideration, and efficiency. You know, at the beginning, were they clear with me what the process and time frames were going to look like? Did they have well-defined job requirements? You know, I really know what I was getting into as a candidate. Were they timely and punctual? Did they call me when they said they were going to call? Did they show up to the meetings on time? You know, it's simple stuff, but when companies get really busy, you know, not, not always the first thing that they focus on. And then at the end, efficiency, is it good use of everyone's time? Does it feel like it's quickly moving to a decision? Do I feel like there's a path to yes that's somehow embedded in what they're doing? And I came to think that the ideal interview process, certainly for individual contributor candidates, probably shouldn't take more than about 14 days. You know, this is a pretty efficient process. And maybe, if you, maybe some of you move f faster than that. I know quite a few companies that move substantially slower than this. You know, once you hit the phone screen, you should be trying to schedule the on-site interview, hopefully later that week or early the, the following week. You shouldn't be the bottleneck for the on-site interview. You know, it should be the candidate. If their schedule doesn't afford it, that's great, but you should be making time for those on-site interviews. As soon as that interview takes place, you need to be gathering feedback, hopefully that same day. Then you need to be uh, working with a hiring manager to move to a decision, and then you should notify the candidate. I think that'd be a great candidate experience that I talk to you on the phone on a Monday, and I know if there's gonna be a job offer or not, like the following fr Friday and a half, two Fridays out. Like, that's, you know, it's anxious when you're interviewing for these jobs, trying to close this stuff really quickly. And the candidate's going to res respect that because they're going to realize, like, wow, this company's got it together. They know how to move things and move to a decision. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the on-site interview itself. It's the bulk of this process, and I'll get through these really quickly because I know you guys can read faster than I can talk, even though I obviously can talk quite quickly. Um, the the on-site interview kind of six steps. Starts with the warm welcome. You know, the recruiter greets the candidate explains the day, you know, answers any questions they might have, provides their contact info. Sometimes people won't make it to the interview. Sometimes the candidate's wondering what's going on, and there's nothing worse than sitting in a conference room wondering who you're supposed to text to tell them so-and-so didn't show up. And then make sure they're comfortable, right? The first thing that designers are typically going to do is they're going to go into a portfolio presentation, and it's kind of stressful, right? They have to kind of get up there and justify their work and show everything, and it's, it's anxiety-producing. So how do you calm them down and help them feel comfortable with that? 
The portfolio present, presentation itself, you know, this isn't just a portfolio review. You've probably seen their portfolio online already. This is how they present it. How do they talk and show their work? You know, all the interviewers that are going to be there in the day need to attend. You should clarify the time constraints with them at the very beginning. Make sure the candidate understands you've got 45 minutes. We're going to wrap this thing up at 10 a.m. or whatever it is. Ask questions. You know, interrupt them as they're talking. Ask some questions. You know, ask them about the team, their specific role. Dig into some of the designs. See how they respond. You know, and I think you should use a standard grading system. For most of my career as a design manager, we just all sort of walked out of the design presentation, and it was sort of like this Roman emperor thing, which is thumbs up, thumbs down, right? We didn't really have a way of thinking about what are we trying to grade these people on. And so, the, the, you know, and I'm going to dig into detail on that here in just a second, but the number one question you're trying to answer in the portfolio presentation is can they do the job? It's a big question, right? Sometimes you're going to walk out of a portfolio presentation and it's not going to be very good. And I would encourage you actually to just cut off the interview at that point. And I tell you, I, the reason I say that is I've never made an offer to somebody who had a bad portfolio presentation, but I've never failed to make an offer to somebody who had a great one. So while I hate to say the portfolio presentation is a tryout, in practice, the data indicates that it's basically a tryout. So if it doesn't go well, there's really not a lot of sense in tying up everybody else's time, stringing the candidate along. It's a tough conversation typically for the recruiter, um, but it is clear and it simplifies what's going on for the rest of the day. So we talk about a little bit like what that standard criteria might be. For me, I came up with these kind of three large areas, craft, collaboration, and communication. So we rated everybody kind of on a scale of one to five against these 15 different attributes. So in terms of craft, we looked at information architecture, interaction design, typography, color, and motion. For collaboration, how they collaborate with design, PM, engineering, researchers, and executives. And then communication ended up being the one that I thought as a manager was most critical that we hadn't necessarily been thinking about as deeply as we could. So one, like, do they own the room? You know, do they really control what's happening in the room? Are they engaging everybody? Are they moving the conversation forward? Are they open to feedback? We start asking questions about the work. Do they get defensive? Do they blame things on the client? Like, I hate that. That's like the mortal sin of all portfolio presentations. Oh, the client just told us to do that. You know, do they think on their feet? And one of the most important things is they manage their time well, right? Do they manage the clock? Because when they're presenting to the team, when they're presenting to executives later, they're only going to have their 15, 20 minutes, right? I've seen designers come in, you got 45 minutes to present your work. They're like, that's great, I got three projects. 40 minutes have gone by and they're just wrapping up their first project. You know, you're like, you're not managing the clock. You need to manage the clock, it's a big deal. Continue with the process, the uh, cross-functional interviews. So now you're kind of doing one-on-ones and two-on-ones with people from across the company. I'm sure that all of you do this already. The main thing that you're trying to see here is, is there a good cultural fit? Like, do you want to have this person on your team? Do they make sense in the company? The next one, the collaboration session. I've used this different times. I don't know how many of you guys use this. I found this to be really useful in that you get the candidate in a room with one or two other folks, and you just riff. You have a jam session about some idea. And preferably, it's not about your product, because you have way too much knowledge, and most of the ideas they come up with, you're not going to like, because you've already tried them. So try to come up with something that's sort of uh, uh, neutral territory for both of you. Travel sites are always pretty interesting, because everybody has some experience with them. Travel kind of sucks in general. The state of design there is not terrific. So people, and it's usually a really rich uh, problem space. So what you're watching for is creative chemistry. Right? Does the candidate help make the ideas better? Like, do they move things along? It's a really critical thing, and it's a, a critical part of being successful as a designer on your team. I actually think all the product managers and engineers should do these collaboration sessions as well. Uh, my friends on those organizations haven't been quite so willing to do that, but I think it's great to see what the creative chemistry is like between people that are joining the product development team. And then last, sort of the, the fond farewell. I think this is a chance for the recruiter to come back, thank the candidate for the time, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. I'm looking at the wrong one. The hiring manager one-on-one. -on -one. So this is where the hiring manager comes in. You know, this is really your job now to help make a decision to sell the candidate. You know, for me personally, the main thing I'm looking for in a candidate is what do they hope to learn? Like, what, you know, we all know that there's a good chance they're going to leave the company at some point in the future. That happens, you know, three to five, seven, ten years from now, they're going to leave. And they're going to walk out of here with a few bullet points. They're going to go to LinkedIn, they're going to put those bullet points in. What do you want those bullet points to be? You know, do you think at the beginning of the job what it is you want to take out of it at the end? And as a manager, that's a great indication to me of are they curious? What do they want to learn? And it helps me understand why they want this job. Why do they want to work at this company? And then finally, sorry, this is the uh, fond farewell. It's a chance for the recruiter to come in, ask, any, ask if the candidate has any final questions. A really critical thing here is for the recruiter to get feedback on the day. How did it go? This is your chance to kind of do some design research and see how your design for the hiring process went. So you can get some really great feedback. Did the interviewers have different ideas of what the job should be? Was everybody clear on the reporting structure? Did everybody describe the company mission in the same way? And then, of course, you thank them for the time and to communicate follow-up. So look, hiring's hard, right? 
takes a lot of time, takes a lot of patience, but it's the most important thing you're going to do, and it's a decision you're going to be asked to make over and over again. You're not always going to get it right, and trust me, it's really painful when you get it wrong, but it's something to think carefully about and try to pour your design sensibilities into really thinking about the candidate experience. There's a great quote from Ed Catmull, founder of uh, Pixar, from his book Creativity, Inc., another wonderful book that I hope all of you have seen and read. Getting the right people and the right chemistry is more important than getting the right idea. You know, again, people plus process, you get great product as a consequence. This is my fifth lesson. We'll blow through this really quick. Uh, I'll post these slides to Slack so you guys can look at all the data there. We need a lot more designers. You know, sitting in Silicon Valley, I'm relatively convinced that design as a skill set is the number one constraint on most tech companies. Like over and over and over again, every tech company I talk up to talks about how hard, they, how hard it is to find design talent. This is an interesting stat. This is from 2014 as well, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is the number of people in the United States writing code professionally. The U.S. government breaks it into three different skill sets, software developers, programmers, and web developers. Programmers that you kind of think of basically as IT people. Their estimate is that right now there's 1,591,100 people writing code professionally in the United States. So if we assume a 10 to 1 ratio between engineering and design, which I think is sort of the bare minimum, but handily it also makes for easy math, that means we need about 159,000 designers working in the U.S. right now. Does anybody think there's 159,000 designers in the U.S. working on software right now? Does anybody think there's 80,000, which is half that many? Okay, no. I don't think we're even close to that 10 to 1 ratio, which is where most organizations, I think, need to be. And of course, it gets a little bit trickier because as you look forward from 2014 to 2024, you see 12.5% growth in the number of jobs. And I have to point out, this is the number of jobs. This isn't the number of people. There's actually more people because some folks are going to fall out of their current jobs. It's 200,000 additional new jobs in the next 10 years, 12.5% growth. So 200,000 additional coding jobs in the U.S. in the next 10 years, 3.5 million new jobs internationally, 18 times as many people writing code internationally as are writing in the United States. Again, if you look at the math, that's 20,000 additional design jobs in the United States, uh, 357,000 new design jobs internationally. And so as a design manager, and as you're thinking about growing your organization over the next 10, 15 years, you have to ask, where in the world are all these designers going to come from? And of course, as all things, they're going to come from the next generation. So this chart comes from the Pew uh, Research Center. There's some debate as to how you break up the generations, and so this break between millennials and Gen Z is still being debated. They use 1996 as a demarcation, so if we stick with that for a second, you realize that Generation Z, which doesn't get a lot of airtime because we talk so much about millennials and uh, Gen X, already 25% of the U.S. population, the largest uh, uh, generation in American history numerically, and growing by 4 million a year. They probably still have another four years to go as a generation. They could add another 16 million people to their generation. If you look at this raw data, they're going to absolutely dwarf every other generation from numbers because, of course, they're the only generation still growing, right? So even if you look at baby boomers at 74 million, we jump up to millennials, they're a good 6 million behind at 68 million. Gen Z already in 2015 had 10 million more people than, uh, than millennials, okay? They could end up with 26 million more Gen Z than there are millennials. And so I like to draw people's attention to what does it mean to be part of Gen Z. I have a couple of teenagers at home. You know, and we talk about how technology is anything that wasn't around when you were born. <laughs> and so we sort of ask the question of like, well, what happened when they were born, right? My son, who's 17, was born in 1998. And let me show you his experience of technology a little bit. So we start in the year 2000 when he's two. And we'll overlay a couple of historical moments here so we can all orient in time. The presidential elections, some big economic events, and of course, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This is what happened with him in school. You see, he enters elementary school right after Bush was reelected. At this point, he would have been very aware of what was going on with terrorism and the various wars. Like, kids know what's going on. You guys have kids. You know what, they know what's going on, right? Junior high, just before Obama's reelected, high school just after that election. Like, their, their experience of growing up is very much like the experience of what, they, of what they call the greatest generation, right? They're growing up in an era of perpetual war and economic uncertainty, very much like the Depression and World War II. And it's creating a generation that's very pragmatic and is already thinking about jobs. And the oldest cohorts in Gen Z, they're already making career decisions. And so I talk about them to you today because if you want to get to them, you need to start getting to them now, right? Otherwise, if they're probably going to go into engineering, product management, other, other fields. And if we want them in design, I think we need to go talk to them about design right now. We need to talk to them about the supply, the demand, the economics, and start trying to recruit. This slide always makes people feel really old. Um, <laughs> So if we start in 2001, when my son is three, that's when Wikipedia came out. 
When he was four, LinkedIn. When he was five, iTunes and the iPod. When he was six, Facebook came out. As he started elementary school, YouTube was launched. Second grade, he gets Twitter. Third grade, he gets the iPhone. Fourth grade, we pick up App Store and Spotify. Fifth grade, WhatsApp. Sixth grade, Instagram. And yeah, my son, we live in Silicon Valley. He had accounts on all that stuff. He had all those devices. He's living in technology. By the time he hits junior high, he picks up Snapchat as a seventh grader, Vine as an eighth grader. So by the time he hits high school, none of this stuff is technology. None of this is new. None of this is novel. He's not trying to figure out how any of this stuff works. This is his life. This is just the background of his life. This is how it works. Like Gen Z is the most digitally native generation, obviously, in history, right? Unfortunately, I actually think that they're going to be probably the greatest design generation in history as well because they're going to grow up in a technology-savvy world where design has really come to the forefront, at least in the American culture. So I actually have a lot of hope and promise that they're going to be a phenomenal force for design. But again, I think if we want to get a hold of them, we need to start crafting a culture that brings them into our companies now. So I want to finish really briefly. This is sort of a bonus lesson. There's three quotes that I've kind of developed or that I've hung hung on to over my career. They're all short and pretty easy to memorize. First one from Ansel Adams, there's nothing worse than a brilliant image of a fuzzy concept. You know, it's really easy to jump into Photoshop, jump into Sketch, do some really cool gradients, you know, make things look really fancy, a lot of pyrotechnics to impress the boss, but then when it gets to users, maybe it doesn't make sense because you didn't do the legwork to really think through the concept. You know, I find that sort of jumping to the visual solution to be incredibly distracting from the harder conversation, often the harder conversation of what the concept should be. So I encourage you to don't create brilliant images of fuzzy concepts. Work on the concept. Number two, design is clear thinking made visible from Edward Tufte. You know, I like this quote because it talks about design more as a way of being in the world, right? It's, it's not, design isn't just what we do, it's not the artifacts we produce, it's how we think. You know, we imagine a future we want to be a part of, and then we think through how we would get there. We try to make it in logical, rational steps, and we try to communicate to other people and get them on board. So I think about design management, clear thinking made visible. This last one, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I'm going to let that one stand on its own. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.